thank you. So actually, uh, security under Android is really a controversial topic, and I really want to dig into application security, not OS security or kernel security under Android. When you actually look at Android, and when you look at all the statements, uh, Google clearly states that Android has been designed with security in mind. Sorry. Better? So uh, when you then dig into what they think about security in mind, it's actually an operating system where every application runs in a unique Linux-based user ID. And the nice thing is that no application has permission to impact another application. But if you develop application for Android and the application can't access the address book, the application can't access web pages, the applications can't dial, it's not a nice smartphone application. So somehow the user needs to give the permission to the applications. And as we all know, that's what Google did. So to use an application, you normally have to grant permissions to make an application attractive and to use certain functions of the smartphone. So when you install an application, the user is requested by the app installer to grant permission. And I now picked our mobile security. And one of my colleagues gave you some surveys. So when you fill out the surveys, you get a free one-year license of our software as a thank you for this. And picking our application, our application asks you during installation that we want to modify and delete storage content. Why? Because we have to identify and we have to remove malware. It asks you that so we could edit your SMS, your MMS, that we could read it why did to all this kind of stuff? Why? Because we have an anti-spam filter within our, our application. So this rights needs to be granted. But I also could be a malicious app, which is transferring all these applications to a command and control server to a third party, let's say for uh, doing men in the middle attacks on online banking. And we could format your storage. We could do a lot of stuff. And it goes on and on and on. And we are for sure a good application. But the average user can't judge what the application is really doing on his Android system. So after you gave these rights during the application installation, it is never checked again by the user. So for example, you give the right to transmit geolocation. The application later on will never tell you now I'm transmitting the geolocation because you granted the right before. If the permission was granted, the app could use the desired feature forever. And the user forgets about it. So what we see in the digital underground, they learn that with a little bit of clever social engineering, they convince the users to download to install a useful application. The user gives the permissions, not exactly knowing what he's doing. And bingo, you're in. You could have a mobile bot. You could have a banking trojan. You could have something which is sending out premium SMS, and so on. So in general, the application security concept of Android by design is good, but it's totally undermined by the permission concept. Google for a while didn't care about it at all. Then there have been some incidents. It was in the news that some bad applications have been around. So Google started with a kill switch to recall applications. And Apple did the same. Out of the sudden, the application is gone from your phone. And if you paid for the application, it's not so funny. Apple did this several times with paid application because they, for example, started to show nude content, which for us here in Germany is not a problem at all, but for some Americans. Google did this for malicious applications sending premium SMS. We looked at this, and of course, also in our research labs, looked at the 
market share of Android and how fast it's growing. So in November 2011, we predicted that there will be a lot of malware under Android in 2012. It's still very low comparing with Windows-based malware, where we have 300,000 new malware per day. So we predicted 130,000 for all of 2012. We predicted that your smartphone might become a biohazard. Immediately after we predicted it, somebody at Google was really mad with us, I tell you. Chris De Bono, one of the development heads for Ice Cream Sandwich, made the following statements. That we are scammers, that we are charlatans, that it's not possible to write viruses on Android, and that we should be ashamed of ourselves offering these kind of technologies, which I think is a pretty strong comment. My development team didn't like this a lot. Number two, it is way too difficult to spread a malware, a virus from phone to phone. It is an Independence Day. It will not magically spread to other devices. This was statement number two. And statement number three, all the major vendors have problems with the app stores. It's not only Google. So this was pretty interesting and I fully agreed with Chris De Bono on the statements because all the malware we have seen so far and we predicted for 2012 for Android was not virus based. It's all a Trojan. It's an app to claim to do something and does something else. So Chris De Bono might be a very good OS developer, but he clearly doesn't know the difference between virus and malware and Trojans which is a big difference in this space. Uh, the problem you see in this market is that the digital underground knows exactly that the Windows time is over. We are in the post-PC era. When you see how unsuccessful Windows 8 is, no matter on mobile or desktop, when you see the market share of mobile devices, the digital underground making millions with malicious code, they need to move to new fields. So they're working heavily on multi-platform malware and their main focus in the mobile space is Android because they always will attack the market leader. And that's a fact of life. The market leader, no matter how good the security is, will be targeted and you can't write software with 10,000 lines of codes without vulnerabilities. Or even if the OS is safe, you use the human element, the social engineering element, just to convince users to click on something. And they will click on it, no matter in private or in business. So November 2011, Google said, it's not a problem, we are charlatans and scammers. February 2012, Google released Bouncer, which was their system to keep the App Store clean. But as we heard already yesterday in the presentation, and what you also could Google and find in the digital underground are ways to fool Google Bouncer. The underground knows how Google Bouncer does the analysis. The underground knows how to fool the system by, for example, delaying the payload with a trigger date in the future. So you uh, place the app on Google Play and you don't do anything with it till four weeks later. And then you start the malicious part of it. That's what you could do. I think that's construction work somewhere, <laughs> not the microphone. So it's a new layer of Android security and it kept away some amateurs from Google Play, but not the professional guys. Here are two examples which have been on Google Play, which have been downloaded pretty often, and they have been Trojanized. The second one we could debate is AirPush, and AirPush is an advertisement framework. So developer could use this to show in-app advertisement and to make money. But we had some customers' complaints because AirPush is grabbing a lot of information from your phone, including phone number, contact, 
uh, details address book and doesn't inform you about it in a certain air push version. So we declared it as a malicious app and every application which had the air push components inside was blocked by our framework. Air push didn't like it at all. They of course uh, contacted us, they involved their legal department, they had a fight with our legal department. Air push then agreed, yeah, from now on by default we show the license agreement and we inform the users what we are grabbing from the phone. And then the problem was solved. But we still see apps out there with an older variant with air push. Why the other stuff here on the list was clear malware just being written to get money from the users. What the attackers are doing is actually the following. The attacker is normally grabbing an app, an existing app, is repacking the app, is adding an additional program code, which is a Trojan, then republishes the app on Google Play and on other app stores because you have a lot of alternative app stores. It's an open ecosystem. So in China, you have 40 different app stores, pretty big. In Russia, you have 70. And a lot of this stuff is not Angry Bird anymore, but Angry Chicken. But when you download it, you get a Trojan for free. You almost could be sure about it. It's a big problem, especially in the Asian and in the Eastern European market, not so much in the Western market. This application then adds on an app market. It will be advertised, so the user is downloading it, and based on the download, it's on the device, permission are granted, and then the attacker has the opportunities for exfiltration, for exploiting the device, for industrial espionage, man in the middle attack, premium SMS, whatever he has coded into the app. So, as I mentioned, we predicted 129,000 malicious apps by end of 2012. We had over 300,000. So we also have been wrong. And for this year, we predict over a million. These are not a million uh, malicious apps with totally different code. We are talking about a million binaries because the bad guys are using the same code and are scrambling it. But we agreed that we use the same counting we are using at the Windows Word. One example what really could happen and how they make money, and please don't use this as a business model because the bad guys made a lot of money with it, but they're all in jail now, word of warning, because it's a very creative business model. This happened in Japan and it affected 700,000 users. And what it was, the application was a porn viewer which was advertised on adult sites. It had an 80 page license agreement you have to accept before installing the application. And a lot of people accepted it because it's pretty common to watch porn even in Subway in Japan. It's part of the Japanese culture. What is not so common is that out of the sudden you are in a conference room, your phone is on the table, the screen turns on and shows a hardcore porn picture. That's called face loss in Japanese culture. I bet it's the same here. Not so funny anymore. What's not funny at all is when then the application after a few weeks tells you, you know, we know you like our porn viewer. As you like our porn viewer so much, we now will send an email to advertise our porn viewer to all your contacts. If you're not willing to do so, pay a month X. And this was calculated based on the number of contacts they have grabbed from the device. Some Japanese people in the US dollar paid more than $700. The underground gang who did this out of Kyoto did 5 million in US dollars within four weeks. Not a bad business model. But don't come up with any ideas they're in jail now, okay? <laughs> so this is illegal, even with the license agreement, which they thought protects them. It will be worse in the future because your phone in some countries already is your electronic wallet. You have NFC, you have real money somehow on the device. And the digital underground tries how to get this information, how to probe there as well. 
I would say Google is waking up. They have enhanced security features. They even acquired a malware test lab, a uh, virus total. And uh, they try to cope with the problem with signatures. But as we all know from the uh, antivirus content security industry, just signatures by itself are not very efficient. It just triggers the bad guy to scramble to obfuscate their code more often. But that's the current approach, what they're doing. Then, of course, you see Samsung Knox and all of this, where they really try to separate private data from business data. So I think business users are starting to get really concerned about all of this. It's in the news. It gives you a bad feeling. Some people say, oh, we better shouldn't use Android in our environment, which I really hate because Android is a great operating system. So what the hell? And it's not the operating system. You can't blame uh, Android for being the dominant system, and the dominant system always will be attacked. The problem is that no matter what Google is doing at the moment, it already has this reputation. And as we know, the, uh, there are a lot of old versions out there without these nice new features like pattern matching. And they will be around for quite a while. When we look at the threats, you have all kinds of threats. You have spying tools which you could use for industrial espionage. You have routers, which give you full, full root access to the device. You have uh, premium services, where the malware subscribes on your behalf to something. You have data stealers. You have malicious this, uh, porn viewer was a data stealer. You have malicious downloaders who are downloading additional malicious content to change their behavior. And you have click fraud for mobile advertisement networks. Chris De Bono in 2011 declared that it's impossible to write a virus on Android. He called us charlatans and scammers, and my developers have been pissed. So they tried to program a virus on the Android, and they managed to do so. We informed Google about this in May 2012. And we told them, we hope you could fix it, but uh, security by obscurity doesn't work. We will go public sooner or later with it. They didn't fix it, and we showed it in August at DEF CON. If you want to know more about it, we have a white paper and everything. You add additional content to an APK, and you resign it. And the message will be, on your Android device, software update, do you want to install a new version? And you click yes, and the new malicious binary is attached to your application. The reply from Google was, yeah, but if you do this, the user will figure it out because every application will show the warning. My reply was, okay, I only infect an application every two days. <laughs> so I'm just be patient as the attacker. And then every APK has a malicious code in it. So it's possible, and this hasn't been solved uh, up to including 4.2. It's a pretty fundamental problem. The problem, how I see it is, Google is great, Android, they have done a great job with open source, so everybody could adopt it. It's an open ecosystem, which has its beauty. You have a lot of flexibility as a developer. You have the choice, if Google Play is not available, to use an alternative app store. Like in parts of Africa, Google Play is not available. So you have to use alternative app stores, which is nice. So it gives you a lot of freedom as a developer. But there are some bad guys out there, which somehow uh, negatively influence this model. Because we might say an open ecosystem is not safe. Because at the moment, everybody's pointing to Apple and say, but that's safe. And I see this especially in business. Why? Because in Apple, it's a biosphere. <laughs> it's totally controlled. Apple lets in what they want to let in, and that's it. It's one app store. You have to publish it through Apple. And if Apple doesn't like your application because it shows new content, bad luck, the application disappears, or likely never makes it into the app store. And this is bad for the development community on one hand. On the other hand, Apple does a damn good job keeping their app store clean because they make a lot of money with it. 
And that's a big difference. I love open ecosystems, but we really need to be careful. So what we have developed is something which we call mobile app reputation. It's a cloud-based technology which automatically rates application. It's somehow like Google Bouncer on steroids. And it not only waits for malicious content, it also looks at CPU utilization, memory utilization, network bandwidth consumption. And based on this, it gives a store, a score. And based on the score, the user could decide if he really wants this application, if he wants to install it. It collects the application and scans them in the cloud. And we collect a lot of application, not just from Google Play, but we already have a lot of independent app stores who have signed up with us and use our technology to get their apps rated. It then does a static analysis. It deselects the app code, private data, access. It looks for the permission and checks if the application does what it says during the installation. It correlates the web queries with our smart protection network where we have 12 billion queries per day to see if it links to known bad websites, known bad command and control servers. It does a dynamic analysis where it looks for CPU utilization and all this kind of stuff. And based on this, it generates a reputation score and a detailed report. The reputation architecture behind is we do the sourcing. It goes into a priest check. Is it a known variant of malware? Afterwards, it goes into the static, into the mobile analyzer, is processed, then the results go to a mobile scoring engine and this then will be stored in our smart protection network in the cloud. So that's how the service works. An app store submits the new apps to us. The apps are scanned and the app store removes the bad apps or adds detailed information to the app listing. With this system so far, this is from end of March this year, we rated over 2 million binaries. Only 670,000 are safe. But safe for us also means they use best practice in development. They are not too crazy on bandwidth, on CPU, and on memory. Low risk, these are the apps who normally consume more than an app should use, 900,000. High risk are the ones which leak out data, which you don't want and malicious, real malicious, with a monitoring malicious purpose as 310,000. So it's quite a bit, but this is unique binaries, not the apps around. This is how such a sample reports look like. This was, you can't read it from here, but this was a malware, but here it also says the battery consumption is average, internet data, traffic is low, and memory is average. So besides being a malware, this thing in terms of development techniques is pretty good. It's not rated bad because it does this, but because it leaks out data and sends premium SMS, so a malware. We recently even did this for a German publication for Wirtschaftswoche. Wirtschaftswoche asked us to rate the top apps, Android apps, being used in business in Germany. And we had some interesting results. Like Sparkasse, the Sparkasse app in the next version of Wirtschaftswoche, they sent in something, yeah, we know about it, we might leak too much data about the geolocation of the user. We know that we didn't inform the user base against it and we rewrite our application, which is nice. So we had some positive reactions on this, but a lot of business people have been really scared by what some of these apps are revealing. You have to think about it. What about if you reveal the geolocation, the unique identifier of the phone and the phone number. Don't you think that this information is valuable when you are uh, the CEO of a big company because you potentially could guess the next merger where he spends his time? And this is what the business people are concerned about. For developers, my recommendation is ensure what public libraries or at framework libraries are doing before you use them. Otherwise, you might end up on a blacklist. Corporate customers are very sensitive regarding data leakage, not end user. 
But if you write apps for corporate usage, think about this. CPU load and battery impact plays a bigger and bigger role in the app selection. We have a lot of companies now running app stores using this technology to figure out that the apps is okay. Quick and dirty might not be the way to go for sustainable business. Again, especially in the enterprise space. If you write apps for a third party, expect that the apps will be tested, not only for functionality, but also for potential risk like data leakage and for negative impacts. And you better have then a good story why you are doing this, or they might kick out your app. What I could offer you, mid of May, we will release a public version where you could check how we rate your app on mars.trendmicro.com. It's already on and off at the moment, but it does not have the full functionality. But if you like, just send in your app and you will get the rating for it. How we see the app. This might be useful really to check the rating for your apps. And we use this to separate good from evil. And we are doing it yeah, pretty often per day. So, and I definitely don't want that one of you guys is on our blacklist. Thank you.